grace and peace and spoiler alert, I suppose, I saw Playmobil the movie. Yes, I am an adult male in his 30s, and I did see Playmobil because I have this movie pass and I see movies for free anyway. I have a stressful job. Sometimes it's worth it just to go to the theater and watch something just to escape for a couple hours. And that's what I did with my wife. We went and saw Playmobil. Uh, it wasn't good, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm not giving movie reviews. I'm giving movie reflections where I attempt to think theologically about the meaning and the message of different films. It's worth saying I'm also not uh, someone who is trying to analyze films from a Christian family-friendly perspective and tell you whether uh, this is something you should take your kids to, whether it has a positive message or not. Uh, I think everything has a message that we can talk about and we can have a good, meaningful Christian conversation with. Sometimes not for children, sometimes absolutely with children. And that all depends on who you are and when, what you can deal with. So let's talk about Playmobil. Playmobil has a message to it. Um, it's an interesting message in how, well, how gospel it is. It is, it is a soteriological message, a message about what it means to have life and life abundantly. It begins with Anna Teller Joy's character, and she wants to travel the world. She wants to live an adventure, and she is vivacious. She is fully alive as she dances and sings with her little brother about her desire to travel, after which point her parents die, and she is left as the sole caregiver for her little brother, which results in depression. It results in a sort of survival setting for her as she becomes more of a parent and less of a child who wants to play and who wants to live and who wants to travel and adventure. Uh, and that's identified. Her, her little brother says, you know, I feel like when mom and dad died, you died too. Theologically speaking, we call this perishing. When, when you are uh, dying more and more every day when, when you are not, not dead, uh, but dying. And that is a description of hell for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believed in him would not perish or in Greek, it's actually would not be perishing, but would have eternal life, everlasting life would have, have a fullness of life that extends and that continues. So are you choosing death or are you choosing life? That's, that's the question of the Christian gospel. And it's the question of Playmobil. Now, what is the answer of Playmobil? Where does life come from? How do we find life? How do I not be dead and walking around, but how do I instead be, be truly and fully alive? Well, the answer I expected uh, being that this is a marketing movie, obviously there to sell toys, is, well, you find life in play. You find life in playing with lots of Playmobil. Uh, and they actually resisted that. And I have to kind of tip my hat to them for not going in that direction. In fact, they give a enemy who seems to have that mentality. There is uh, an Emperor Maximus character who sings a song about, you know, I give the people what they want and what they want's a fight. I, I'm about exhibition. I'm about entertainment. I'm about play without any meaning behind it. And that's looked at as bad. It's looked at as dangerous within the message of Playmobil that Maximus is a bad guy. And what we have instead is a search for meaning through narrative. A search for meaning through meeting interesting people, interacting with them, and indeed, I think in the greater sense of the movie, through the stories that are popular of our culture and time. All through Playmobil, we're meeting representatives of familiar intellectual property. We're meeting the Pirates of the Caribbean, but we can't call them the Pirates of the Caribbean. We're meeting a Western town. We're meeting Jurassic Park, but we can't call it Jurassic Park. That's an interesting thing about the way the Playmobil movie came into existence. Playmobil movie is obviously a ripoff of 
the Lego movie or a cash grab of the Lego movie. They saw the Lego movie be successful and they said, well, we can do this too. But I think one of the reasons why Lego's movies and entertainment shows and uh, video games, the things they're making are so successful is because of the intellectual property. Because Lego has the ability to put Superman and Batman together and to use Star Wars characters as long as they're Legos. Playmobil has none of that. And so they're always doing um, versions, things that are similar to, but legally distinct from, familiar products. Well, at the end, through interaction with all of these narratives, all of these stories, uh, all of these things that cause us to think about adventure um, vicariously, always through toys or through other people's stories, we meet the fairy godmother who is all about that base, Megan Trainer, and Megan Trainer gets Anna Taylor Joy's character to sing, I believe. And when she believes, she is filled with life and life abundant, and they are able to uh, come down against Maximus and his ilk and succeed and return back to the real world with a newfound relationship with uh, life itself and with, indeed, her family, her brother. That's all uh, a decent message, I think, uh, an, an interesting depiction of something that I'm doing. I'm watching movies and I'm thinking about them and what they say, and as a result, I think I find some life there. There's a, another discussion we have to have, though, if we're going to talk about meaning and we're going to talk about theology in the midst of interaction with intellectual property, and that is queer coding. Queer coding, um, if you're not familiar with the term, or gay coding, which is the more specific term that used to be used more broadly, is when you use stereotypes and innuendo to imply that a character is not straight um, in, in order to make them more interesting or oftentimes to make them more clearly evil. Because for many, many years, uh, non-straight people, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender plus people were demonized by the church and by society at large as untrustworthy and evil. And so it became popular to, no, nobody's having sex in, in Playmobil the movie. Uh, they're, they're all plastic toys, but yet there, there are hints. And, and we give using often unfair stereotypes of the LGBTQ community hints that all of the bad guys are not conforming to ordinary gender stereotypes. So the main bad guy, Maximus, speaks in a high voice. He wears a lot of makeup. Um, he dances and prances around in a little bit of a uh, unusual way for a, a masculine character. And you get the impression, without it being said, that he's gay. Um, you also see a queer-coded version of Jabba the Hutt, where Jabba the Hutt has been made female, but has a mohawk and is violence-obsessed. Um, the chubbiness is depicted in a sort of unflattering way to uh, certain depictions of lesbian women. And you have a queer-coded version of Blofeld, the main enemy of the early, and now again, the most recent James Bond pictures. Uh, where Blofeld has been made into a woman with a scratch over the eye. Um, there was a woman like that in From Russia with Love as well, and, and we're fighting this, uh, this queer-coded version of a Bond villain. So all of the villains have been queer-coded. They've been made to act like non-straight characters in plausibly deniable ways. Whereas we've got this character of the brother and he meets a whole bunch of heroes that he's going to work alongside with warriors. And oddly, all of those warriors are straight coded versions of familiar queer coded 
characters, queer-coded protagonists. So he meets a straight version of Captain Jack Sparrow, where Captain Jack Sparrow, in the most familiar IP, is, you know, a, he's got some sugar in his gas tank. He's a little bit more flighty, and you never hear about his particular gender preferences, but you... Uh, you get the sense that he doesn't conform to normal gender stereotypes. Well, this version of a pirate captain totally does. Um, you see a Amazon woman who is reminiscent of Robin Wright Penn's depiction of Antiope in the latest Wonder Woman mo movie, which, you know, that's an Amazon. There were questions there. Well, not in Playmobil. She is very straight-coded. You get a version of Conan, the Barbarian, where he had been rippling chest and um, and guards, and we step back from that, and we make Ukuk very straight-coated. Um, and finally, you have a straight-coated version of Nebula, which puts a little bit more Boba Fett elements in this character, who was just featured in the biggest movie of all time, Endgame. And so why, why, Playmobil, are you straight-coating all the good guys and queer coding all the bad guys. Well, you're saying something when you do that, and you're saying something that has moral and theological import, and I don't know if you mean to be. <sighs> so, if you want to live fully, if you want to not be walking dead, you need to live in the midst of these narratives. You need to think about the stories that are around you and what they mean and what parts of them you want to emulate. That to me leads me to think about the LGBTQ community and how we are treating them, how we are depicting them. And I have to say Playmobil for a movie that made me think about narratives you didn't seem to put a lot of thought into your own. I don't know. What do you think? You can share about it in the comments, or if you want to see a bad children's movie sometime, there are certain to be more coming out in January, and you can actually send me an email. We can go together if you live in the Orlando area. You can also share this video, comment on it, and engage in many, many ways. And when Sing the new, new song, twill be.